all, if at all there is a notification, it should be stronger than the EIA notification of 2006, which came in between after 94, after 97, and before 2020 draft that we are considering today. But even in that notification, there was some dilution, and in 2020, there is dilution to the extreme, which is not acceptable. I will give you a number of examples, but let me just talk about the process of the clearance that starts with but doesn't end with the environmental impact assessment. It starts with environmental impact assessment and we insist that it should be linked with social impact assessment. This is what is brought in to the Land Acquisition Act which came up in 2013. Till then, 1894, the British law was applicable and hence project could start with even a small piece of land acquired and then go for clearance and it may get it or it may not get it. But now this is officially and formally being permitted through the new notification that they can acquire just a small portion of land out of the total land and land attached resources. Everything comes with land. That was British definition of land acquisition and that continues in the country even today. When land is acquired, the minerals, the major minerals underneath also are owned by the corporates, so on and so forth. So what I was saying was that in case the environmental impact assessment is to be carried out, it should be linked with the social impact assessment is what is said and provided for in the 2013 Act. But that Act is also bypassed and new acts are brought in by the state governments which is against the federal structure and which is against the land as a concurrent issue in the concurrent list in our constitution. Because if you want to take certain decisions, those are to be made as is expected by the handful of, I say handful of because 550 or even few thousand in a country like India with 130 crore population is not a big number at all. So a handful of elected representatives are expected to take decisions which is not devoid of their politics. It may be the politics uh, of interrelations within even the federal structure that India is amongst the states which we experienced in the COVID-19 and lockdown situation. And it may be the politics across the countries where the borders are formed with rivers and then the catchment of a river which spreads beyond a single nation state cannot be treated and cannot be taken care of, protected uh, unanimously. So friends, it is social, political and economic impacts and causes which are linked with the environmental issues and impacts as well. And hence what becomes important is laws, rules and regulations. But one cannot start with laws. Laws are representing or uh, reflecting the constitutional values and the framework. The framework includes the right to environment but also right to life and livelihood. And that framework includes the directive principles, not just the fundamental rights, which are which the state is duty bound to follow. We need to remember that the first EIA notification came in 19, uh, 1986 when EIA notification was brought in. In that time itself, we have seen it was created to have a second balance on the following on second balance of mining of coals and minerals, then on infrastructure and development projects, thermal and nuclear and hydro power projects, and even on real estate and industrial projects. But what happened is, as Ma'am rightly said, it was diluted in every possible manner. Even if we had a system before, even then it was diluted. But now, coming back to the present situation, in scenario, even now it's diluted. More than that, we need to remember that the proposed project from being approved without proper oversight on ecology. This was prevented before and even before the was study of environment inputs, before starting an industrial project. And thirdly, there was clearance only based upon evaluation of environmental impact 
and compares various originators for the project by comparing ecological and economical state scale. That was a condition before. Even then there was lapses, but as Mark rightly said, even if there was lapse before, the present notification should have had a better positioning even in the ecological system. Now, what we need, what we essentially understand with the notification 2020 is that the corporate and bourgeoisie corporate system are emerging, thereby no clearance is needed for them. And secondly, no study for project starts on environmental impact. Now, this is what makes it problematic. When we talk, talk on the fact that it's problematic, A, it is about post facto clearance issue that comes up. Now, with this draft, draft notification, what happens is any industry project can start off functioning without any clearance on operations. Now, this becomes problematic, A, because this is giving the corporates a kind of autonomy in creating the operations, which is essentially looting the way Britishers did before. Britishers looted our country and now the corporates are looting. This is a bourgeoisie situation where the proletariats are pushed back to the subaltern society. And we have seen how in Narpata Valley Mama put out a movement against the same, against the way in which this, in which this kind of uh, a feudalistic structure existed. Now, secondly, another reason why this notification became problematic is because of the list of projects exempted on the basis of a strategic project. Now, talking about the same, we need to remember no information in public domain has been put out on what these strategic projects are, which means inland waterways and even national highways projects are also in this category. Thereby, people can't question, citizens can't question. For that matter of fact, even the representatives can't question, as Mark rightly pointed out. This, this makes it very problematic because even the RTIs can't be used in this project, which is entirely a very problematic structure, which means EIA notification will not just destroy the ecology, but rather also affect the human rights, as Mark rightly pointed out. Now, the third problem that comes up is about the provision to exempt projects. Now, in the construction field also, and another thing that comes up as a problematic structure is that the violation can only be reported by government officials or representatives and not citizens according to this notification. Now, this is highly undemocratic and goes against the constitutional value. As Mark rightly pointed out, based upon the constitutionality and legality aspect, when we look into the same, we need to remember the voice of dissent has been stifled. Not just the voice of dissent has been stifled, but rather this will not give a mechanism in which we can take a legal mechanism whereby the present system does not work. Now, this is very much problematic because no violation can be reported. Now, who are these government officials or representatives who can report the problem? They are the ones who have been appointed politically, as Max said, because the political appointments takes place and not the expert committee or the expert committee itself we have seen how they have been appointed. This is the case in the entire political system. The stru structure, the reforms is needed in the structure itself as such. Now, when we talk about other problems that comes up, we need to remember that a public consultation period of time framework was put down, was brought down from 30 days to just 20 days. Now, this is highly a big problem. Why? Because there is no public consultation taking place in just 20 days. And even then, the voice is not being heard. The central government is not hearing the voice of opinion, nor the voice of the opinion. Now, again, another problem that has come up is that no need of any clearance certificate for any projects in 100 hectare land or even, for that matter of fact, even in petroleum projects and even in distillates. We need to remember who are the ones who own the petroleum projects in India. It is certain bourgeoisie corporates who are an MLC and who have got maximum capitalization, maximum capital, and maximum wealth generation. There is a wealth, there is a wealth divide in this nation now between the rich and the poor, and the proletariat does not get a chance to stand up for what they have made. Even the fruit of labor, for example, for instance, Eli Durkin, a famous sociologist, talks about the fruit of labor has been has not has been rejected in that manner. The same thing happens over here too. The fruit of labor is not being given by the people, so it's not just an ecological dimension. Even the economic dimension comes up. Even the human rights violation comes up. As we have seen in Nakada Valley and even in, in Uttarakhand too, and even in Chalakudi, uh, a river valley protest that have happened in Chalakudi too, there is a rights violation that have taken up, which is unconstitutional. Now we can think about the, as I rightly pointed about, about the impacts of this notification if it becomes law. If it becomes law, it will again 
causes unconstitutionality, especially in with regard to deforestation would increase. Okay? Deforestation would increase. This we have seen not just in India, even in Amazon river basin, where in Brazil we have seen this thing. And even in various parts of other countries we have seen about deforestation as an issue. From a personal experience, recently when I visited Chirapuji, what I have seen is that the, the, due to the re- deforestation, the rainfall have gone down in Chirapuji. Before we have heard how many others, and even during the British time, who used to write by saying, when we go to Chirapuji, we have to carry umbrella. But that's not the case now. We don't need an umbrella. It's fully under sun. There is no rain that you can witness when you go to Chirapuji. Our ecology is being destroyed. That same thing that happened in Kerala, during the Kerala floods, where the overflowing dams, dams have caused a big issue because dams cannot take into consideration the maximum amount of water. This has destroyed again. And the same thing has happened with the Western Guns, when Dr. Madhav Gargil's report and even in Kasturi Ragan report have pointed out on the same regard. Now again, natural disasters would increase day by day in the same manner and even the extraction of minerals and coal spirit limit increased from 30 to 50 years with this draft notification which causes imbalance in the environment and even the ecology. Now we need to remember what I am exactly pointed out which is about the dilution of environmental laws. Whatever laws we had, it's been diluted by the central government. This is the same case. Now what is the central government talking about? Their argument is basically that it is for the development. It is beneficial for the development of the country. Now we need to remember whose development are we talking about? That is the primary question. This is not the development for a common man or not for a proletary, not for the tribal society who have been affected like in Narbada or in other places. This is the this is the development of only corporates. Which corporate are we talking about? The multinational corporates who run the petroleum and other industries in India were controlling the government to a bit of only corporates. Which corporate are we talking about? The multinational corporates who run the petroleum and other industries in India were controlling the government to a certain extent. This is why it becomes problematic. Now this argument of government stand falls directly because of the fact that the corporates are benefiting from this because corporates will be getting in petroleum and mineral rights and so on for query. Now, coming back to the point you have seen recently how the LG polymers leak in Vishakapatnam happened and even when in Assam when Oil India fire that happened and so on. This is the situation and we do have a hope of rain when movements led by Medapadwaka in Mahapada Valley and even like with a ray of hope from our history like Chipko movement and so on. And now also we have movements and let's hope that this ray of hope will go on and this conversation that we have today will lead to a discourse which will lead to a positive change and reforms. Thank you. Good evening everyone. Uh, first of all, it's a great honor, ma'am, to listen from you, a great privilege for all of us to be listening uh, from you. I'll li- I would like to start by pointing out certain assumptions that we as uh, you know, young people have about environment before this conversation about environmental activism and problems and challenges facing environment begins. It seems easy for a lot of us to assume that India must have made it a habit to take environment seriously. Uh, especially when it's faced with um, questions of development. It seems easy to assume that now we've mastered the idea of taking care of environment when we are um, drafting development plans. And uh, especially since Environment Protection Act of 1986 came after India's possibly biggest man-made tragedy of the Bhopal gas tragedy. Unfortunately, all of these assumptions have been proven for. Uh, because uh, case in point, the oil well fire in Bhagjan, Assam in May 2020, as recent as May 2020. So clearly our country needs to step up in its game of environmental conservation. And it's not just an isolated incident which happened maybe 50 years ago that causes the environmental damage that we are facing today. So it's a collection of, it's an accumulation of a number of factors that's causing whatever damage we are facing today. And if we let the EIA draft 2020 in the form that is presented today uh, get passed and become a law, this will be probably the final nail to the coffin that uh, it will carry as balance uh, that our environment is facing, especially in our country. Now, um, there are a lot of things that we as individuals can do to contribute to a sustainable environment, to a greener future, like, like um, you know, sure, uh, 
making sure that we consume eco friendly products and a lot of things like that. But then again, as Ma'am very rightly pointed out, comes the importance of civil society organizations. Comes the importance of society as a whole when it um, when it's time to bring about a macro level change. Now, uh, when we look about the industrial ecosystem uh, that this country has, uh, the regime type, in our case, the democratic government, has a lot to play there. Uh, a lot of um, stake, for the lack of a better word, in that eco in the creation of that ecosystem. Now, when we're faced with a micro level change like that, I think because we are a democracy, by extension, it becomes the duty of all of us citizens to act and um, to ask questions about uh, the changes in ecosystem that every act, not just EIA draft 2020, every act that seems to, uh, you know, seems to bring about. We've discussed a lot about the problems with EIA Act, with the way it's been drafted, with the way that it has diluted public consultation and a lot of those things. Now, there have been over 17 lakh comments that have been sent to Ministry of Environment um, as a response to EIA draft. But I think what MAM stands for and what this webinar stands for is the fact that our responsibility do not end there. I think there has to be an instrumental shift in the way that we see environment, not just as an instrumental uh, tool for us, uh, you know, for humankind to meet its needs, but a more integrated, um, more wholesome view of uh, environment, living in harmony. And I think that shift in perspective is the point, uh, starting point. And this shift in perspective cannot come without public consultation, which EIA draft is trying to dive in. And this public consultation is not is not supposed to be limited just to uh, you know the higher echelons of the government or certain government missionary. It has to be um, you know given to people who live there. Uh, like Nan said, the people who are being displaced are the ones who have most experiential knowledge. Maybe our knowledge system, our uh, understanding of public consultation and development plans should take into account these experiential knowledge. And the timing of this draft, uh, you know, EI draft 2020 sort of crept upon us during the pandemic. And this timing of draft has effectively silenced the voices of these people who are going to get most directly affected by that. Uh, when uh, asked to present their queries and problems through video call or new technological measures, we are excluding a large number of the population who are going to be affected by this. And maybe it's our responsibility as students uh, to ensure that everyone has access to proper, uh, you know, redressal measures as well as if they don't have that access, we become the voice for uh, their concerns. Um, and not you know, uh, take part in silencing their voices. Now, public consultation is a very important part and it's a very important starting point. However, our dilemmas uh, when it comes to dealing with environment does not end there. Now, when we talk about reparations, when we talk about compensation, how do we decide upon these compensations? Who gets to listen? Government, corporates, or is the people who are actually involved? We need to change the system uh, in which we uh, see these different situations. And the cost benefit analysis, like we said, who prepares the cost benefit analysis? If our, our cost benefit analysis comes in favor of corporations so highly, how do we ensure that this cost benefit analysis is transparent? How do we start a process that includes more people? These are very important questions that we need to ask um, ourselves. Also, when we talk about development, how is it that our development plans end up sacrificing only one particular section of the society? How do we deem this one particular section of the people responsible to make these sacrifices and not just everyone? And how are we, uh, you know, compensating them about these uh, sacrifices? Are, uh, is, does our idea only involve the brief domain of monetary um, compensations? If it's just that, I think, like ma'am repeatedly pointed out, we are ignoring the constitutional right to livelihood uh, in a large way. Now, also, public consultation transferring to consent. How do we assume that even if we have a consultation, it just, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't stop being a mere consultation, but it actually um, translates to something proactive from the side of the communities that are actually involved? 
how do we make sure that the environment impact assessment has a social impact assessment uh, you know attached to it how do we um, assess the social impact how do we measure these things again pointing out one more problem with the draft this idea of ex post facto clearance is basically a way of legitimizing power acts against everyone so um, we need to understand that our individual actions are important but uh, in case of legal measures like this we need to take a macro level action and it's important for us to be uh, aware about things and it's uh, important for us to join at a level that will be structural enough to bring about a change in the legal systems and maybe we should start by rethinking our systems which is exactly why we have this webinar because it's important that we realize that environment is significant for us and asking questions to the authorities who have an impact on environment even more so so let's maybe put aside the narratives that privilege the ease of business over environment and rethink our view of environment which should not environment should not be a concern that um, represents itself in front of us and there is a monumental draft of this measure it should be a constant concern it should be a daily issue for us to ponder upon so i leave you all with this final statement which i got uh, when i was uh, sifting through the internet about the reviews of the uh, eia draft 2020 a reviewer very rightly said this remember this the cost of averting a disaster is always always going to be less than disaster management measures i repeat the cost of averting a disaster is always going to be less than disaster management measures that that you can thank you we have discussed a lot about the problems with eia act with the way it's been drafted with the way that it has diluted public consultation and a lot of those things now there has been over 17 lakh comments that has been sent to ministry of environment um, as a response to the eia draft but i think what mam stands for and what this webinar stands for is the fact that our responsibility do not end there i think there has to be an instrumental shift in the way that we see environment not just as an instrumental uh, tool for us uh, you know for human kind to meet its needs but a more integrated um, more wholesome view of uh, environment living in harmony and i think that shift in perspective is the point a uh, starting point and this shift in perspective cannot come without public consultation which eia draft is trying to dive and this public consultation is not just is not supposed to be limited just to uh, you know the higher echelons of the government or certain government machinery it has to be um, you know given to people who live there uh, like ma'am said the people who are being displaced are the ones who have most experiential knowledge maybe our knowledge system our uh, understanding of public consultation and development plans should take into account these experiential knowledge and the timing of this draft uh, you know ei draft 2020 sort of crept upon us during the pandemic and this timing of draft has effectively silenced the voices of these people who are going to get most directly affected by that uh, when uh, asked to send their queries and problem through video call or new technological measures we are excluding a large number of the population who could be affected by this and maybe it's our responsibility as students uh, to ensure that everyone has access to proper uh, you know redress measures as well as if they don't have that access we become the voice for uh, their concerns um and not you know uh, take part in silencing their voices now public consultation is a very important part and it's a very important starting point however our dilemma is uh, when it comes to dealing with environment does not end there now when we talk about reparations when we talk about compensation how do we decide upon these compensations who gets to receive government corporates they all is the people who are actually involved that includes more people these are very important questions that we need to ask um, ourselves also when we talk about development how is it that our development plans end up sacrificing only one particular section of the society how do we deem this one particular section of the people responsible to make this sacrifice when not just everyone and how are we uh, you know compensating them about these uh, sacrifices are uh, does our idea only involve 
the brief domain of monetary um, compensation if it's just that i think like ma'am repeatedly pointed out we are ignoring the constitutional right to livelihood uh, in a large way now also public consultation transferring to consent how do we assume that even if we have a consultation it just uh, uh, you know it doesn't stop being a mere consultation but it actually um, translates to something proactive from the side of the communities that are actively involved how do we make sure that the environmental impact assessment has a social impact assessment uh, you know attached to it how do we um, assess the social impact how do we measure these things again pointing out one more problem with the draft this idea of ex post facto clearance is basically a way of legitimizing power acts against them so um, we need to understand that our individual actions are important but uh, at in case of legal measures like this we need to take a macro level action and it's important for us to be uh, aware about things and it's uh, important for us to join at a level that will be structural enough to bring about a change in the legal system and maybe we should start by rethinking our footprint which is exactly why we have this webinar because it's important that we realize that environment is significant for us and asking questions to the authorities who have an impact on environment even more so so let's maybe put aside the narratives that privilege the ease of business over environment and rethink our view of environment it should not environment should not be a concern that um, represents itself in front of us and there is a monumental draft of this nature it should be a constant concern it should be a daily issue for us to ponder upon so i leave you all with this final statement which i got uh, when i was uh, sifting through the internet about the reviews of the uh, eia draft 2020 a reviewer very rightly said this remember this the cost of averting a disaster is always always going to be less than disaster management measures i repeat the cost of averting a disaster is always going to be less than disaster management measures let that sink in thank you